Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you've um, made us um, your children, Lord, uh, bought with your blood. So we ask, Father God, by the power of your spirit, you would take the things that belong to you and reveal them unto us. Lord, that you would speak to us from the borders of another world. Bring the atmosphere of heaven to this very room. Lord, we know that we can't do anything without you, so we ask, Lord, that you'd make us disciples, Lord. That you'd use us, Lord, for your kingdom and your purposes, Lord. Help us to lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets and help us to run with patience the race that you set before us, looking unto you, Jesus, the author and finisher. We love you, Lord. We look to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, at this point in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the crowds are growing, people are uh, pressing around Jesus. Uh, many people are following Jesus for many different reasons. Some are there to see the healings that he's doing. Some of them are into the teaching. Some of them are, um, are looking um, for a, a, a miracle for themselves. Uh, it's just a short time that Jesus has started his public ministry and he's turned the whole region of Galilee upside down. Um, religious leaders are coming from Jerusalem to hear what he has to say. And he's basically, uh, he's, they're basically in opposition to him at this point. And it's going to lead to his crucifixion. Because he basically, he called them hypocrites on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you do things to be seen of men, but God recognizes things that are done from the heart. Uh, you love money. You're looking for prestige. Uh, he, Jesus is just not doing it their way. He's not going their way. In fact, he's healing lepers, which has never been in, in never recorded healing of a leper in Israel until Jesus starts to come and he sends them back to the temple. He's taking Roman centurions and, and he's healing their servants. He's helping Gentiles out. So he's doing things that aren't really, really the norm. And he doesn't, he's, he's bypassing the religious system and he's bringing the kingdom of God. He's proclaiming the kingdom of God. It's at this time that Jesus tells his disciples, look, when the crowds are getting huge and everybody's pressing, he wants, to, he wants to thin out the crowds a little bit. He's looking for a reality with his disciples. He's not interested in just curious onlookers. He's interested in people that want to follow him because of who he is, not what he can do. There's a big difference be of being attracted to Jesus, and many people are, and following Jesus, two, two different things. And so Jesus is gonna start to whittle them out, and I think that's good because the disciples are gonna head into a storm, but before that, he meets these two disciples that come to him in verse 18. It says, now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. I'll go where, wherever you go. I will follow you basically anywhere. So as I said, great multitudes are following Jesus, and he gives them the command, look, we're going to go to the other side. We're going to get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. As his popularity is growing, Jesus isn't interested in collecting a church. He's interested in disciples. He isn't interested in curious fans. He's interested in people that really want to know him, really want him to in invade their life. You understand, you understand what I'm saying? When you get saved, you are born again by the Spirit of God. Your life is not your own. You be, belong to him now. So that's what he's looking for. He's looking for people like that. So it's at this time, a scribe comes to him and says, look, I profess I'll follow you anywhere you go. Now, it seems the scribes, they know the Old Testament. They copy. That's what they do. They copy the Old Testament. So I think he's thinking, I'm like educated. They're going to want me. Most definitely, I'll, you know, he's going to, the, the red carpet is going to be rolled out and I'm going to become a disciple right away. He's so excited and moved by what he's seen Jesus do. He has all the credentials. He says, I'm all in. And Jesus is going to tell him, look, you know, it may look glamorous. You know, lots of times we look at Christianity and, and you know, in today's day and age too, it's, 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 it's selling, like we're selling God or something. No, no, we're, we're telling people that they can get to heaven through the dead and resurrected body of God himself. That's the message. That's the gospel. Sometimes it looks glamorous and people think it's, 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 oh, I want to follow Jesus, but they don't count the cost. So what he's going to say is here, this world's not going to be your home. Verse 20, and Jesus says unto him, saith unto him, the foxes have holes. That means the foxes of this earth, they have places to go. The birds of the air, they build nests, they have nests, but the son of man hath nowhere to lay his head. So if you're going to be Jesus' disciple, this world's not going to be your home. 
You're just passing through. You're not comfortable here. You're not laying down roots here. Jesus Christ is going to come back and set up the kingdom of God. That's what's coming. This is not the kingdom of God. In fact, the whole world lies in the lap of the evil one, it says. So the prince of the power of the air is now here on this planet. People die. Jesus is not comfortable with the situation that we have here. He didn't come to fix, to, to fix this world up. He came to utterly change it. He came to bring a new kingdom. One day, a new heaven and a new earth is going to be here. So he says, look, if you're going to follow me, you're not going to be at rest here. There's going to be no peace. Does anybody recognize that in your Christian life? It's like, you know, you get saved and there's, there's, there's no rest. Jesus, you know, promised to rest when we meet him face to face. It says this in Revelation. This is where I kind of get the idea that there's going to be no rest. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the spirit that they may rest from their labors. I get it's going to be laboring down here and their works do follow them. Son of man is not settled on this earth. And look, if you want to follow me anywhere, you have to be like Abraham. Abraham was a man who was overloaded with gold. But everywhere you see in the Old Testament, he built a tent. He set up a tent because his attachment to this world was temporary and he built an altar everywhere he went because he realized that his real connection was with heaven and the sacrifice of an innocent substitute. Jesus Christ came to give us life. He came to die on the cross, a lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. And if you're going to follow him, you're not going to be comfortable on this earth. Now, the term son of man is used 81 times in the Gospels, and that's Jesus' favorite term for himself, fully God, fully man, the last Adam, as it were. And Jesus said this, my kingdom is not of this world, this present world system. And this fallen world, like I said, is ruled by Satan. We're going to meet him here at the end. That's why I'm giving you a little preamble on it. God could never feel at home here until this is changed. This current situation is changed. Jesus Christ changed it on the cross. He defeated principalities and powers. No longer it has a grip over your life. You can be set free. And one day he will come and redeem the planet totally. If you want to be his disciple, you must live for another world. Is anybody excited about another world? You know, people, they come to church because they think they want to fix this world, but the Bible really teaches something totally different, that we're heading towards home. This is not home. It's imperfect. That's why we have failures. That's why we all have troubles and sin. And that's why he's going to lead his disciples here to, into a storm. Verse 21 says this, And another of his disciples, that's how we know the first scribe was a disciple, said unto him, Lord, suffer me first. Now, you can never have Lord and me first in the same sentence. It doesn't work. <laughs> suffer me first. Lord, you're, I, 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 you're, you're going to tell me whatever I want to do, but let me tell you something first. Let me first go and bury my father. Suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. So we have another disciple come and he has a me first question. Um, let me take care of my father. Now, when you first look at this, it's like, oh, Jesus is so mean. He won't let him go home and, and, and go to the funeral or, 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 or to view one or nothing. You know? No, what this guy is saying, listen, let me go and take care of my dad and my family before I follow you. Let me wait till he dies, take care of the estate. It could take decades. It could take, who knows how long it could take. I need some time. I'm not ready to follow you just yet. And you notice the longer that you wait on doing anything, the more excuses you'll find not to do it. And Jesus says something that's, that's, that's amazing. Let the spiritually dead, let the dead bury their dead. You follow me. And Peter would say, Jesus, you're the, you're, the, you're the only one that has the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? There's nowhere else to go. Seriously, there's no place left to go. If you've tried it all, you realize that Jesus is the only place left to go. Now, it's a hard saying, but if you think about it, it is true and it is honest. He's being honest with disciples. He's telling you the cost. He says, look, look, if you're going to get your information from people that are spiritually dead, let, the, let them bury their own dead. You're spiritually alive. You follow me. Amen. If we're going to be looking for, 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 for help from people who don't know Christ, you're going to be a sad, sad Christian. That's for sure. 
Who are you going to live your life with? Are you going to live your life with Christ, the only one who has the words of eternal life? Who is your family, really? Who do you belong to? Many of us think, well, and I love my family. We want to see all our family members saved. But your real family are those who are born again by the Spirit of God now that you're born again. And Jesus would say when they kiss mother and brother and sisters, they come to him outside. He's teaching a Bible study. And they say, Go tell Jesus, it's so crowded. Go tell Jesus to come out here. His mother, brothers, and sisters, we're here. We're, 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 we're here. We want Jesus to come out. And Jesus would say, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who my sis- who's my sister? Those who do the will of my father, they are my brother. They are my brother. They are my sisters. And I got to tell you, there's a, there's, a, there's a pernicious thing in the church where we go to the world for help. We don't need the world. Amen. We don't need their opinion. What we need is Christ's opinion. Amen. We need his power. The spiritually dead... Let them bury their own dead. You can live your life with Christ. Who can make us alive? Only Jesus. And Jesus understood that. And he told everyone who his real family was. So is, we have two disciples here. One was too quick and didn't realize the cost. He didn't count the cost. I'll follow you anywhere, really. Will you really follow me anywhere? Well, look, everybody else is at home here. If you follow me, you're never going to be at home here. Do you want that? Count the cost before you come. Jesus, let me first go be with my family. Let me do, let, let, let me take care of my job. And, you know, I, I did that for 10 years. I remember, you know, I felt called to, to teach the Bible, but yet I, I held on for 10 years. Let me first make sure that everything's fine over there. Until I just gave up. I, he just wore me down. God has a way of doing that with his disciples, you know. So we have one, doesn't count the cost, and the other one's too slow. And the ones that do follow him, the ones that do get into the boat, he takes them directly into a storm. And Matthew, I think, gives these two incidents of these two disciples because he wants to let us know, look, it's not like Jesus didn't warn you, okay? When you got saved, you meet people, they get saved, and they go, this is the worst thing I ever did, you know, I can't believe it, everybody hates me, and my life has been worse, and like, I, got, I can't drink anymore, I can't get cirrhosis of the liver, and I can't get high anymore, this is terrible, what a terrible life I have. And you're like... Listen, following Jesus, you know, there's a cost to it. You're going to lose some family. You're going to lose some friends. You're, gonna, you're not going to feel at home here. It's going to be a lonely walk. What Matthew is saying, it's like, not like Jesus didn't warn us when we got into the boat. We knew, we knew the cost. So following Jesus is going to take us into trials. It's going to take us into storms. It's going to put us at conflict with this present world system until Jesus Christ comes back and changes it. Verse 23, we'll read down to 27, and then we'll... we'll Look at it. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he was sleeping. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to die. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? And he arose, rebuked the winds in the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? When he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. So the Sea of Galilee, I've, I've been there one time, and when you come, I always read these stories, and I thought the Sea of Galilee was this massive sea. It's like a huge lake. It's only... 15 miles by five, 13 miles long by five miles wide. It's 620 feet below sea level. And the northern end is very shallow. So when the wind comes down the mountain, they've actually seen waves that get 15 foot high in the Sea of Galilee. And storms have been known to stir up these types of waves. It's shaped like a heart too. That's why they call it Chinaroth. It's shaped like a heart. But it's very beautiful when you see it. In Mark's gospel, it says that they took Jesus. They took him on the boat. When he started heading to the boat, they took him on the boat. Now you got to realize, these guys are the professionals. They're the professional fishermen. Jesus is a carpenter, okay? So they're like, this is what we do. This is our boat. Come on on our boat, and we're going to get you to the other side. We got you. You just go sit there. You take a nap. Um, And remember, Jesus led them right into this. This is Jesus' thing. He told them we're going to go. So it's his idea. Now they're taking over. They're going to run the ship, and Jesus is going to go take a nap. Um, and I started thinking about that. Isn't that how we get saved sometimes? You know, Jesus is there. Yeah, we go, Jesus, get on our boat. We're going to get to the other side. You know, we have another side. Jesus has taken us to heaven. We have an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away. We're on a journey, and we're going home. This is not our home. We're like Abraham. We're just passing through. We're pilgrims here. So we're on this earth, and we think we know more about this earth than he does. So we say, Jesus, get in a boat, take a nap. We'll get to the other side. I'll wake you up when we get to heaven. Um, <laughs> 
But there is a journey, there is a cost along the way. So he goes to sleep, and this storm is gonna come. Um, we all launch forth with Christ in the beginning, and we think we, we, we're in our comfort zone, but we find out that um, in this world we will have trials, we will have difficulties. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he was sleeping. So Jesus takes a nap. It's not his boat. You ever been out with somebody on their boat? They're the captain, so you just let them do what they're going to do. He leaves the drive into them. Um, we also take note here that we look at this, Jesus actually got tired. Is that amazing to you? Like he worked so hard, he healed everybody at Peter's house. He did all these things. This whole day's been a long day. So he just goes and, and crashes. And I started to think, you know, God took on the form of a servant. You know, we just sang these songs, the incarnation, Christmas time. We start to think that God emptied himself took on himself the form of a servant, understands what it's like to be hungry, to be tired, understands, you know, when, when we think about who God is, well, does God, love, does God love prostitutes? Of course, we see and forgive them. Does God want people to be fed? Yes, he does. He feeds them. Does he want people to be healed? Of course, he touches them. You know, and I look at, that, how do I know God is good? I look at Jesus. He's the reflection of God. He's the image of God. He's the son of man, the last Adam, as it were. Wears himself out helping people. He's heading to the cross, and he goes and takes a nap. He knows how we feel. Because anybody ever get tired? You guys, sometimes you get tired. It's a long sermon sometimes. Last week I killed you. I know how. I'm going to go shorter today. <laughs> and another thing we know about Jesus is he's not a light sleeper, amen? My, I want my wife to be like him, splashing water in his face, and he's, you know, Jesus could have... The, the whole boat could have tipped over. He would have been on, on the bottom breathing air, got up and walked right across the other side. It didn't matter to him. <laughs> Evidently, he's not a light sleeper. So he's sleeping while his disciples are taking on water. And I don't know about you. Did you ever feel like that with Jesus? Uh, I'm here dying. I'm drowning. I'm bailing water. And you're over there sleeping. Ever since I got saved, this has been a difficult journey. But the Lord led these guys out there for a reason. They're in the middle of his will. And as believers, you know, we, we're going to get trials. We call them trials, storms, trials, difficulties, temptations. Um, and as, as believers, I don't know about you, but from the moment I got saved, I've always either been heading into a storm, in a storm, or coming out of a storm and getting ready to go into another storm. Um, there's always storms. You know, there's never, like, I always think I'm going to get rest one day, and, and it doesn't exist. It's like a lie. It's like an evil lie. Oh, once I get this done, and then, I get, then there's no rest. Now, tr trials or storms can come for two reasons. One can be correcting. You're going off course, so God sends a trial your way. He sends a difficulty your way because he wants to put you back on course. They can be corrective in nature. Now, we like to judge what everybody's going through their trial with. We don't know why some trials happen, but some are corrective, and some are just to make us more like Jesus. They're perfecting. He sends a trial our way because we couldn't learn anything about Jesus that we need to know unless we went through a trial. See, you can get theory all day long, but there's nothing like lab work. There's nothing like actually, like I can read this story and say, great, I don't want to go through the storm. I'll live vicariously through the disciples. I won't do that, and I'll just sit here and be safe. That's not how it works with the Christian life. When you get saved, you're going to join a group of people at church, and guess what they're going to do? They're going to aggravate you. You're going to run from church to church because you're going to try to find a perfect church, and you're never going to find the perfect church. And if you do find a perfect church, don't join it because then you'll make it not perfect anymore. <laughs> So you get, you get hurt all along the way. You try to find these things and you're continually, there's trials and there's difficulties and then there's things that you don't even expect that happen to you. And all the while, Jesus is leading you into these things to show you that your sufficiency doesn't belong to yourself, it belongs to God. That he's the one that's gonna get you through the storm. You think he's sleeping, he's not sleeping at all. Amen. He's just waiting for you to come and ask and you will receive. So they're perfecting, they're correcting. Now, storms are, are divinely appointed to show us the power of Jesus and to teach us about having faith in him and trust in him. None of us get out of this life without these storms. Eventually, we're going to die. That's the valley of the shadow of death. It says this in 1 Peter 4.12. So don't think it's strange. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, 1 Peter 4.12 which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. People get saved and they're under this mistaken impression that once you get Jesus in the boat, everything's going to be hunky and dory. Hunky and dory, hunky dory. <laughs> hunky and dory. I like that, hunky and dory. Don't know what it means, but 
everything's going to be great. They preach you the sermon that say, yeah, you come to Jesus, you'll get everything you need. You'll get new cars and you'll just name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and you'll always be healthy, you'll always be wise and nothing bad is going to happen to you. And then, you, then you're like walking with Jesus and bad things happen. This stuff doesn't work. No, in this world, you will have trials, he said. You will have. Don't think it's a strange thing when these, hap these things happen to you. It's prescribed. He led you into the storm to show you that when you go through the ultimate storm, which is death, he's going to get you to the other side. Amen. Says this, Paul says he's learned how to enjoy them. I'm not there yet. I'm just going to tell you what Paul said. <laughs> He said unto me, when Paul prayed for him to remove the thorn in the flesh, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And it seems... To us, that we can't always live through the correspondence course of the scripture, he needs to take us because we're so thick into our own difficulties, into our own trials, so that we can learn to trust in him and lean on him and not on our own understanding. Now, I haven't arrived there yet of enjoying them like Paul, but I'm realizing that, that they're necessary. I don't like storms, but these disciples are in a real one, and they're at their wit's end, and Jesus is sleeping. Now, a verse always comes to my mind, you know, when we think Jesus is sleeping. You don't care. You don't care about me. I'll tell you a story I told Wednesday night crowd. Most of you don't come to Wednesday night, right? If you heard Wednesday night, just go to sleep for the next two minutes and come back, come back away. Um, I remember coming home. My wife is here. Isn't she? Oh, yeah, I'm in trouble. But anyway, I remember coming home with, you know those bags that you get at, at um, Giant? all those plastic bags with the holes in them and you try to carry 30 at one time but you don't forget that your one finger didn't go through two little loops <laughs> and that finger just happens to be like the root beer bottles, you know what I mean? So I'm carrying all these bags in. My wife is on the phone enjoying her time talking to her girlfriend and I'm like carrying all these bags in and I'm getting indignant about it because she doesn't care. The water's coming in my boat. Nobody cares. Anyway, well, I drop the bottle of root beer and I'm like, you don't care. You don't all these bottles of root beers are busted in the, in the, in the thing and that's how I felt. Like the disciples, you're just sleeping. You don't care. You're on the telephone and you guys are watching TV and nobody cares. Nobody cares how difficult this is. And a verse always comes to mind, you have not because you ask not, you know? I just picture them bailing out water and looking at Jesus like, how, how can he do that? We're dying and he's sleeping. Verse 25 says this. Now, I know you've never said that to the Lord. That's just, you know, them. They did that. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're, we're dying. We're, we're all going to die. So they've done all they can at this point. They're at their wit's end. So they call upon the Lord. And when you call upon the Lord, what happens? You will be saved. So Jesus is sleeping because he's indestructible. He don't care. Water splashing on his face. And he's just snoring away. He's a, evidently, he's not a light sleeper. And his disciples are terrified. Um, it says in Mark 4, the disciples say, carest thou not that we perish? They think Jesus is going to die too. They think the whole ministry is going on or Jesus is going to die and he's just laying there and he don't care. So wake up so we can all die together. Did anybody ever do that to you? They're sick, so they wake you up to tell you that they're sick. It's like, why'd you do that? I could have slept fine. You're the one that's sick, not me. Hey, wake up. I've got a problem. <laughs> The storm seems to have a supernatural element to it because, you know, these experienced fishermen, even they're terrified, you know. They're in over their heads, literally. They're in over their heads, so they wake Jesus up. They think the whole thing's going. Now we're all going to die, and you're going to die with us. What's the matter with you? Don't you care? Get up. And I, I don't know about you, but I've often felt that way with the Lord. You know, I don't know what to do. And any time that you're in ministry or when you get saved, there's an element of spiritual warfare to it. You're not at home anymore. Once you get saved, the Bible says there is no discharge from the war that you're in. You ask Christ to come into your life, and then you start to see, wow, I've got more problems than I thought, you know? <laughs> I got saved and I thought everything was going to be fine and then Christ is exposing me for who I really am and I'm realizing that I sin less and repent more. 
I'm realizing that there's a spiritual element to my life now that wasn't there before. I have conviction. I want to follow Christ. I want to love him back. I want, I want to please him because he, I want to love him because he first loved me. I want, I want my heart and my affections to be set on things above. I have this battle now between my flesh and my spirit that didn't exist before. So there's a supernatural element to it. And often I feel that way, like, Lord, you know, you don't care. At least comfort me while I'm drowning here, you know? I'm supposed to be your pastor. You gotta love me. I'm so faithless. I get upset when I get a flat tire. I think God's getting me. I'm trying, what did I do? <laughs> let me tell you something about God. He didn't lead you out of Egypt just to let you die. He led you out to lead you in. He that began a good work, the Bible says, is he's gonna be faithful to complete the work that he started in your life. Think of the logic of the cross. If he didn't spare his own son, how will he not give you all things freely through him? There is a plan, and the plan is that Jesus Christ would die on the cross and rise again the third day and pay for the sins of any man or any woman, all, no matter how bad they are, past, present, and future, that you could be born again, that you could be his disciple, that he would get in your boat, and he's going to get you to the other side. It takes faith to believe in the unseen. Without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God. And that's showing a lack of faith after all that I've seen Jesus do to say that, you know, you don't care about me, I'm going to die over here. And you know what? Paul learned to say, look, hey, man, if I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. Great. Bring it on. I'm not there yet either. Pray for me. So, and you know, after all that God's done in your life, we would think we would trust him. And you would think after all the miracles they saw that they would trust Jesus. You would think. But see, we know the rest of the story. We're like, if I was on the boat, I would just be chilling next to Jesus with my head on his shoulder. Well, wait, 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 you wake him up. He's going to make everything go calm again. But, you know, we know the rest of the story, but we're all living our own chapters. We're all living our lives, our own journey. And we don't know. We think there's things, you know, I don't want to be cavalier, but there's things people are going through in this room that are devastating to them, that are difficult for them. Great trials, great storms, great, great mental anguish, great turmoil. And they're wondering, hey, Jesus, you still in my boat? You awake? I'm taking on water here. Don't you care? Don't you love me? That's how they felt. And this story is recorded for us because we're all going to feel that way one day. We're all going to have that difficulty in our lives. So God is gracious here because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Lord was waiting for them to come to him. And that's the lesson. Come unto me, all you that are weary, heavy laden. I'm going to give you rest. Don't worry. And he says unto them, verse 26, why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose, and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. It automatically goes back to calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Literally, in Mark, he says, be muzzled, as if there's something behind the storm. He says, be muzzled, and then it doesn't take any time for the waves or you know, did you ever get in a bathtub and watch the waves go like this? It takes a while for them to get calm again. Imagine everything just going and going calm. And you're standing there wet, like, and the sun's out. And birds are chirping. <laughs> Jesus says, where is your faith, man? You're with me. We're getting to the other side. You know, and in my fear, I don't know, like them, and I don't know about you guys, in my fear, sometimes I can abandon all logic or all understanding. I teach Bible studies. I know Christ. I know his word. And sometimes when I'm going through a difficulty, I start to panic. I start to panic. I start to get, I want him to move faster. I want him to do something right away. His word tells me that he'll never leave me or forsake me, that he's with me to the end of the age. His word tells me that he loves me. I know that he loves me because he died on the cross for me. I know that he's forgiven us and cleansed us and washed us and broken the power of the enemy over us and has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his light, his dear son, the Bible calls it. And that there's an inheritance for me that's indestructible, undefiled, that fades not away, that's reserved for me and you. I know I'm going to home. This is not home. And I need to always remind myself of that. And the Bible tells us Furthermore, he's coming for us. Do you believe that? He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Don't let your heart be fearful or troubled. There's lots of things, lots of storms in this world that are troubling people. We look at our world today, and you can get really paranoid and really crazy about it. People are panicking all over. I see kids with panic attacks these days, which blows my mind. 
You're 16, you know? I said, what's the matter? There's stress, high stress, high anxiety. People's hearts are failing them. We've got terrorism. We've got, we've got all kinds of nonsense going on in the world, all kinds of storms. The Bible says he'll never leave us or forsake us. Do you believe that? And he says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. If you believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house or many places as well. If it weren't so, I would have told you, lo, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you can be with me too. This is not home. There will be storms here. But he overcame them all. And if he overcame them, we can overcome them through him as well. And the ultimate storm will be when we die. In fact, you know, as I look at this, he already put this whole episode. Some people say, well, it would have been great if Jesus kind of warned them that there was going to be a storm, you know, as a, a Bible study prior. Well, he already put this in his word in the psalm. Psalm 107 says this, and it's an amazing psalm because it was already recorded by David. And it says this. Psalm 107, 23, all they had to do was pull out their Bible. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and they are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. Verse 29 is amazing. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Does this sound like he wrote this story beforehand? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. The whole stories and analogy that God, though the storm seemed to rage, and one day there will be a storm called death that's going to rage in your life. One day you're going to think, and you know what? It's all of a sudden going to become like glass as soon as we pass through. The, we let go of this earthly coil and we burst into his presence. It's going to be a day that's going to seem like so calm. We're just, it's, going to be, we're, it's going to be amazing. And we're going to realize he was with us the whole time. Jesus with us through all our storms and more importantly, at the time of our death as well, we will one day step through death with him into the calm and he's gonna still our fears, calm the storms, restless hearts will be calm, all that nonsense will, will, is gonna bring us home. I, for one, can't wait. Everything will be immediately calm. Who can't wait for that? A great calm. Anybody want need calmness in their life? Look at me, I'm stressed every week. You guys should be praying for me. The disciples are more surprised of the calm than they are. They're to like, that's weird. They only saw his humanity in all this, his sleeping. They had no idea that he had power over creation. What manner of man is this? They marveled, saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Well, it's much more than a man. He's, he's the God, in, God man, God in human flesh, the last Adam, the one who created everything, the one all things were created by him, for him, and through him. Not anything that was made. Principalities, powers, rulers, everything that was made was made by him, for him, and through him. Furthermore, nothing can ever separate you from the love that he has for you. Not height, nor depth, things created, things to come, angels, principalities, nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. What manner of man is this? He's much more than a man. He's the God man. He's the one that can pay for all your sins, God in human flesh. And let me tell you something, your boat will never go down with Jesus on board. Amen? Look at our world today. Everybody is panicking. The Middle East, our country, is like bailing out a sinking boat. This is not our home. Just cry out to him. Don't try and keep the boat up. We're getting to the other side. We're getting through it. We're not fixing it. Jesus Christ is bringing it. The big difference. Now, the storms are just starting for these disciples. There's a reason Jesus wants to get to the other side. He wants to set a man free that's under the grip of Satan and to bind the strong man. Verse 28. When he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils. 
Now, I'll stop there before I read verses 20 and 29. In Mark and in Luke, you'll find one man. One man seems to be the spokesman, but there was two. They hung around in tombs, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. They're terrified of them. And behold, they cried out, saying, what have we to do? Now, I don't know how they spoke, um, but you've seen the movies. So they're saying, what manner of man is this that's able to calm the wind and the sea? As soon as they get off the boat, they say, what have we to do with thee now, Jesus? I don't know if their head's spun or anything like that. The son of God. So they know who Jesus is. So it seems the demons know who Jesus is, but the disciples are having a hard time figuring it out. Um, it's amazing. What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Underline before the time. So the first two people they meet when they get off the boat. So we think ministry is going to be over once we go through one storm, and then we meet two demoniacs on the other side of the boat. You ever that ever happened to you? In Mark and Luke, we know that one man was the spokesman. So the enemy is waiting for them after the storms. After the storm comes and Jesus silences the storm. In Mark, it says that they have chains. They bind these up, guys up with chains and they can't hold them down. They bust the chains. It says they cut themselves. They're naked and they cut themselves with stones. So they're, they're cutting themselves or disfiguring themselves. They're, 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 day and night, they're howling. They're hiding among tombs. It's crazy. There's an enemy, man. When you look at the enemy, there, there people say, oh, is there evil in the world? Well, we can look at our world and we can see it. When you see what the enemy really wants to do, this is the state he wants to take humankind to. Yeah. See, Satan hates mankind. Yeah. He wants to mar us because we're made in the image and likeness of God. He wants to destroy us. He wants to isolate us. He wants to make us raving mad in our minds. He wants to take everything good and everything holy from our lives and just destroy it. He's a thief. It says this in John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan and his, and his minions are not your friend. They want to make you a slave. Now, Satan is brought these guys to the point where they're so they're possessed that they can they have extraordinary strength they're they're alone they're stark raving mad and that's what he that's where he wants to take all of mankind he him and he's a leader of a malevolent band okay of fallen angels and unclean spirits that are trying to destroy mankind he wants to make man in his own image. And you look at the world today with drugs, 35 million abortions, the violence that we have, child molestation. We have transgender. What, what is, it's, it's just, it's a mess. It's changing everything that God made and flipping it all upside down. It's, it's destroying it. It's taking the role of a man and making it different. Taking the role of a woman and making it different. It's destroying families. It's destroying people. We have psych wards filled Suicide is the leading cause of death of teens. Did you know that? What's making them want to take their lives before they even live it? What, what is so depressing about our world today? There's no future. There's no hope that people are taking their lives. Eventually, he wants to make us in his image. He wants everybody to take a mark. The mark of the beast is coming. Anytime he can desecrate mankind, he will. And we see that in these men. They're alone, they're isolated, they're lonely, they're all by themselves, they have no control over themselves. They howl, they scream, they have superhuman strength. And why does he hate mankind so much? Because we can be redeemed. Jesus Christ is coming, that's why he's there. That's why he went to those tombs. He wanted to set those guys free. And he wants to set us free as well. He hates humankind because he knows that the redeemed will one day judge angels. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, know ye not that we, the redeemed, the church of God, the ecclesia, the called out ones, we will judge angels one day, the Bible says. He knows his judgment is set. There's a set time for the judgment. The unclean spirits say, have you come to torment us before the time? They know there's an, a time appointed for them to be judged. Now, in the Bible, many people say the fallen realm is just Satan and his fallen angels. The Bible teaches something different. There are fallen angels who can take on the form of, of, of a man. They can eat. It says they go into Sodom and Gomorrah, God's good angels, and the men want to have sex with these angels, okay? In Genesis 6, it also talks about fallen angels coming down and co-mingling with women and creating Nephilim. Most people and every scholar that you would read prior to uh, 
Uh, prior to the Reformation, especially early, early church fathers and first century theologians will tell you that the unclean spirits were the dead Nephilim, were the spirits that were trapped here on earth until their set appointed time that God's going to judge them. They created these unclean spirits, these fallen angels. The fallen angels that did this in Genesis chapter 6, it says in Jude and Peter that they were chained in deep darkness in Tartarus, and they were chained there until the end of the world. Meanwhile, their progeny, the spirits, these unclean spirits is what you would call ghosts. They're not your dead relatives. And there's people on TV that are searching for them in those places. They're, they're, they, they know they've been around watching us for for. for thousands of years. They're not your dead relative. They're unclean spirits, malevolent, dark spirits, the progeny of Satan and Satan's seed, as it were, from Genesis 3 on, you'll read about it. And so these unclean spirits, they seek embodiment. They seek to take people over. They seek to destroy people, cut people, hurt people. They just want to mar everything because they know they cannot be redeemed. He hates mankind. So there is a difference between fallen angels and demons in the Bible, according to the Bible. They're not all one thing. Now, the demons, they're orthodox in their beliefs, too. They believe more than Christians do. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They got no problem with that. The disciples are still trying to figure it out. The demons believe in a place of torment. Most churches won't teach in hell. The Bible specifically tells you there is a hell. There is a place of torment forever that Christ came to save us from. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, the Bible says. The demons believe in that. In Mark and Luke, it says that they beg Jesus not to be thrown into the abyss. Don't throw us into the, the abyss. They don't want to do that. So they're terrified of outer darkness. They believe in Bible prophecy. They believe there's a time that they're going to be judged. They believe there is one God and they start to tremble. They identify Jesus as the Son of God and they know, they know that he is there to destroy the works of the devil. Amen? That's why Jesus came. Before Jesus died on the cross, the world was filled with the occult and worship of false little G gods. When Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, he broke the power of Satan in a way that was unheard of in the old centuries. That's why we see all these demon-possessed people in the Gospels that are getting delivered. Verse 30 says this, and there were, they were a good way off from a herd of, of many swine feeding. That's pigs, hogs. So the devils besought him, so they have to ask for permission from Jesus, if thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. They would rather go into pigs, into a herd of swine, than to go into the abyss. So you have to realize this too. They have to ask for permission. Everything in the spiritual realm is done by permission. When you get saved, you have to permit Jesus to come into your life. Lord, save me. I don't know what I'm doing. I need you to inhabit my life and change me. That means whatever it takes to make me more like you, do it. That means make me sick if I feel like getting drunk. When I feel like watching pornography, make me ill. Lord, change me utterly. Change me from unrighteous to righteous. Make me holy. Make me your child. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. I give you permission in my life to break the chains that bind me. I give you permission to rule my life. You, you have to ask him to come in. He's a gentleman. He doesn't bust the door down. Conversely, the same thing goes in the fallen realm. When you play with the occult or you play with things, especially if you're not born again, you are inviting evil spirits and bad things into your life. You're giving them permission to harass you. That's why it's very dangerous to play with the occult. And we see it going on in our world today. Interesting fact, too. Anybody hear about aliens? I like to talk about them sometimes. I know it's weird, but... People talk about alien abductions. It's another form of demonic mischief. And you know the one thing that stops it? They haven't figured it out. If you call out the name of Jesus, the whole thing stops. Duh. Now a question arises. Christians come to this passage. You've got to remember, this is before Pentecost has fallen. This is before the Holy Spirit has filled believers. And the question arises, 
What can Satan do to a believer? What can he do to a believer? The better question is, is what can he not do to a believer first before I'll tell you what he can do to a believer? The first thing he cannot do to a believer is internally possess a believer. He can harass a believer, he can mess with your mind, but he can't possess you to where you have no control. S Jesus has broken the power of Satan. So he can't do that in a, in a literal sense where you get this amazing power or, or, or something like that, or you switch into another personality. If people that say they're saved and do that, there's one of two things. Either they're faking it or they ain't saved. To have a demon is to be possessed by one. Colossians 2.15, the Bible's clear. It says, he disarmed powers and principalities and author authorities. Colossians 1.13 says, he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. 2 Timothy 2.26, it says, we've escaped the trap of the devil. Acts 26, 17 through 18 says to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. 1 John 5, 18 and 19 says he who is born of God, God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. Ephesians 1.13 says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 4.30 says we're sealed with that promise to the day of redemption. When you are sealed by God, nothing is going to stop the destination that you're headed to, which is heaven. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That power of sin has been broken. Now, some people will say, well, what can Satan do? Well, Satan can do this. He can work on your flesh. Okay, that's what he can do. That's all that he can do. We, we are saved, but now we have a new spirit and we're born again by the power of God. We have new desires. What is holding us back is our flesh. How does Satan do that? Through the world, our own flesh, and him and his minions. So they can tempt us on the outside. They can send fiery darts through our mind. They can send depression and anxiety. As much as you give in is as much as you're letting Satan get a foothold in your life, but he cannot possess you. What you have to do is say, Lord, I really do want to be set free. The problem is with many of us, we think we have a demon of alcohol. You don't have a demon of alcohol. You're just addicted to alcohol with your flesh. <laughs> and I don't think demons are running around saying, I'm the demon of alcohol. I don't do loss. I don't do any of these things. So I can't, I can't work on that guy. <laughs> Call another demon, demon of alcohol, because he's got an alcohol problem. I'm only a lust guy. The demonic realm doesn't work that way. They're always working, and they're always working for ways to make you fall. They know our weaknesses, if it's gossip, if it's alcohol, if it's anger, if it's bitterness, if it's lust. And these forces, they work. They work on our mind. And if our mind is not stayed on him, we're not in peace. So we want to be stayed on Christ. We got to realize he's in the boat because he can break the power. These guys are stark raving mad. And at the end of this story, the one guy is going to be in his right mind. So what can he do? Well, he can tempt you from without. He can tempt your flesh. You don't have a demon of lust, like I said. You just got lust. You're a flesh. He can bring false doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.1, doctrines of devils. He brings that into the church. He has fiery darts that can mess with your mind. Depression, anxiety. I have seen... And we should see this at the end of the age. We are seeing more of a demonic, more of a, a, a fallen angelic presence inside the church and outside the church. And I'll tell you why, because we have a mixed multitude. Amen. We have some people that think they're saved and they're not saved. And that's the problem. We have depression, we have anxiety, we have panic attacks among young kids. We have this impending sense of doom because we realize that things are going at an accelerated rate. Jesus Christ is returning very, very soon. We see an apostasy in the church, and I want you to realize the enemy is real, and you have to be on the alert. You have to have the full armor of God on. Now is not the time to be playing games with the, with, with the word of God or with your spiritual life because things are heightening in our world. Who can calm any storm in our life? Jesus, he can calm any storm. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So you give him permission. I got to tell you today, if you haven't done it, give Jesus permission to change your life. Real between you and him. It's not a church. You're not joining a church. You're not becoming a member. You give Jesus permission to utterly change your life. And then do this. Yield to what he tells you. And you will find victory. I guarantee it. Verse 32 says this, and he said unto them, go. And when they were come out, 
They went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and they perished in the waters. So Jesus says, go, and the demons obey. He has power over them, and he sends them straight into the pigs, and they run down the, the hill, and it's the first instance of suicide in the Bible. <laughs> Deviled ham, as they say. So he has power over that realm, amen? I mean, and you know what? I think sometimes Christians give the devil too much power. They, oh, they, oh, I bind you, I do this, I do that. Let me tell you something. The name of Jesus, they flee. The name of Jesus. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is power in the name of Jesus, just the name of Jesus. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. The evil one comes, he can't touch you. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Your destination is secure. He loved you. He knew your name before the foundation of the world. He's going to change your name. He has a home for you, prepared for you. He died on the cross to make that a reality. He that started the work is going to complete the work. So don't give the enemy too much credit he's defeated and let me tell you something you have all things that pertain to life and godliness and if the church would wake up and see the power that they have they stop thinking he's something great because he's nothing he gets seven years and then he's done Amen. he's a defeated foe you only give him power that you let him have and i see christians walking around defeated because you're giving in and you have weapons at your disposal and you have the power of the Holy Spirit at your disposal. And if you're born again, you can be set free. Do not tell me you can't be because I can show you people that have been set free. Do we struggle? Of course. When I came out of the world and I came to the Lord, I struggled with drugs and alcohol. Every time I fell, he was there to forgive me. I confessed my sins. He was faithful and just to forgive me and to set my feet on a rock and keep going towards him. I run a race and I run it patiently and I look at Jesus while I run it. I don't look at the enemy. He ain't nothing. He's defeated. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And one day I will rule and reign with Jesus. One day we will be realized as the, as the noble beings that he created us and made us for. Human beings were not made to wallow in the dirt and the mire of sin and to be destroyed and to wreck people's lives and to do all these dirty deeds that are going on. No, that's the enemy. One day Jesus Christ will set everything free. Redemption is drawing nigh. Now is the time to get on board. So the herd of swine, they... And it's interesting, too, the pigs don't even like demons, but people like to conjure them up. They want to, they want to, they want, our world is, 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 is run by, by like a lot of false things. I think if you realize how much the occult played a part in what's going on, on television, behind the scenes, the movers and the shakers, if you knew what was going on, you'd be shocked. This is ancient stuff. It's been around a long time. The Antichrist is going to be a master of dark sentences, the Bible says. So the pigs can't even stand stand them, and they 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 commit suicide, and they, they run into the water. Now it says in verse thirty three, and they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city. So they had swine keepers, which is illegal in Israel. So they were keeping. See, it's a great crossroads there. So lots of Gentiles were there. So these these Jewish. People, they had, they had herds of swine. It says 2,000 pigs die in, in Mark, which was the whole town's business, and they were selling them to the Gentiles. So they went and they told everybody about what happened. They came in, and they that kept them fled. They run into the city, went their ways in the city, and told, ev told everything and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. So they're freaked out. They go tell everybody. So on the eastern side of Galilee, there's a thriving pork business there. So the town business is basically in the lake of Galilee. Verse 34. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him. They sought him that he would depart out of their coast. So the whole city comes out to get rid of Jesus. They want to get rid of Jesus. They love the pigs more than they love these two guys getting set free. So Jesus isn't good for business. They want profits over salvation. We see a lot of that going on in the church today. It says in Mark that the demon-possessed man is sitting there. He's seated and clothed and in his right mind. So you see where Satan wants to take him, raving lunatics, and where Jesus wants to take you, seated and clothed and in your right mind. 
This guy was a stark raving madman running around howling at the moon naked, cutting himself. And now he is seated and clothed in his right mind and he's begging Jesus, Jesus, let me go with you. Isn't that amazing? There's hope for us. Hallelujah, right? Anybody here stark raving mad? <laughs> howling all night long? There's hope. There's hope for each one of us. That there's nobody outside of, of, his, of his touch. There's nobody that's too far gone. And Jesus tells the guy, so everybody has a prayer. The demons have a prayer. He gives them their prayer, sends them in, into the thing. The town has their prayer. You got to leave, man. You're bad for business. So he leaves. The one guy that begs him, look, can I go with you? Jesus tells the guy, no, you, I want you to stay here. And I want you to tell everybody in this area what God has done for you. Because you'll be the greatest witnessing tool ever. Yeah. Could you imagine him walking up to you if you live in, 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 in the area of the Gergesenes? You're that dude that was running around naked, cutting himself? Yes, and Jesus healed me. Let me tell you about Jesus. They're like, you have to stop and listen. Man, I couldn't even walk down that road. You would run out and beat me. We tried to chain you down. We couldn't help you at all. The world cannot help people that are entrapped by Satan. Only the church can. Only Jesus Christ can do that. The men can come. The demon possessed are set free. There's no storm that Jesus can't calm. There's no bondage that he can't fix. And there's no, no storm too big. There's nothing too great for him. And if you're captive to sin this morning, I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ can set you free. That's the greatest gift you'll ever get during Christmas time, is to be set free. Sad thing is, is so many people just want Jesus to go away. Just go away, too much power. All you have to do is ask. Isn't it amazing? And it, sometimes it seems so easy, but I have been around people and I've seen them ask and it blows my mind. There was a real connection there. And it happens in a spiritual realm that we can't see. But the effects are like the wind. The wind blows through the tree. You start to see their life change and you're like, it's, it's incredible what Christ can do in a human life. If you'll just ask. If you'll just come to him and ask. Jesus Christ is, is, is that powerful. He came to set us free. Father, we love you, Lord. We look to you, Lord. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, that you have that ability. Lord, as we sing these last songs, Lord, I'm grateful, Lord Jesus, that you love me, Lord, that I was a, I was a madman, Lord, and you saved me too, Lord. And Lord, thank you for putting me in my right mind, Lord, and giving me a commission to go tell people about your great grace. Lord, I pray for anybody in this room that might be hung up, Lord. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you set them free that they would call upon your name, Lord Jesus, and that they would leave here, Lord, empowered to break those chains that bind them. Father, you're the only one that can do that, Lord, so we call upon you now in your name. Amen.